And now he's starting to develop that a little bit more, and just that sense projects a little bit more confidence for him. Okay, so we're going to get back into some things regarding appearance. Um, a few other things, you want to kind of get a general idea of what they're looking like. So they come in, and they are dressed, let's say, very professionally. Um, maybe they just got off work, something along those lines. There's some things you can infer. There are some things that you can decide about. Um, and, you know, they're going to line up with some of the other things you're going to talk about. Some people who look like they just barely climbed out of bed, that's going to tell you a little something about what's going on for them that day. Um, now, I'm not saying you're making a judgment, but technically, you are assessing. So we got to have some sort of basic categorization, basic judgment about what's going on with this person. If you notice that they're not very well shaved or their their hair's all over the place, things along those lines, I'm not talking about wacky hair, about different hairdos. I'm more talking about how do they look when they approach you. Now, you're going to see people in several different instances. Sometimes, you know, for example, I've seen people that look really great even in inpatient care. And then I've seen people who look like they haven't moved from their bed in four weeks in private practice. So it's going to depend on what that looks like. Then we're going to get into behavior. Now behavior includes any and all motor activity. So something I make note of there is check out how they're walking, what kind of gestures they utilize, um, what sort of movements. Um, and that means if you see erratic movement, you know, if you're looking at maybe there's extra stiff body frame or something along those lines. It also includes impulse control. Um, and impulse control, especially when you're looking with kids particularly, is going to be something really noteworthy. If you walk out in your waiting room and you have a kid that's throwing stuff around the waiting room or is just sitting there very, you know, sunk into the chair, doesn't want to get out of the chair um, when you uh, talk to their parent or something along those lines, those are all things that you're going to make note of. Um, this stuff can be very much coordinated with the emotional construct that we're going to get to in a second here too. And it is a possibility to look at suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation, and or other things that may denote their impulse control issues. And that, you know, because all those are impulse control issues. Um, something I might note is, you know, sexual stuff um, or teasing or aggressive behavior, other things along those lines. Um, all, of the, all of that stuff can be noted within behavior. Um, if their behavior is especially erratic, you know, um, things like uh, they come in, sit down, then they go back outside, or they're pacing the, the, uh, the waiting room waiting for you. These are all things that you can make note of in regards to their behavior. Then you're also going to be looking at their speech. Um, when they're talking to you, or for that matter, not talking at all, which you may have from time to time, um, especially with young people. They might sit there and let their parents do the talking. Then you try to ask them direct questions. And really what we're, we're looking at, and you're going to learn this in counseling, you probably already have an idea, is asking the open-ended questions. Because if you ask yes or no, you're going to get some yes or no answers. And that's great, but they're not going to give you much more information than that, and you're going to spend a lot of time getting yes and no's. So tell me more about that is a perfect example. And I, I, utilize, I may utilize that a lot in my own counseling, but the idea here is that you're trying to get as much information as possible. So utilize questions that emphasize gaining that information. The next part is going to be emotion. All right. Now emotion, again, you can denote suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation. I know a lot of people are uncomfortable with these ideas, but you have to ask these sort of things. I particularly ask them with every client. I don't care what's going on. I want to get an idea of what sort of emotions they're going through. And if you hear about anger, perfect. Well, what happens with your anger? You know, those sort of things. Um, how do you handle it? Uh, other things like, you know, maybe sadness. Okay, well, do you ever feel, you know, along with feeling sad, do you ever feel really lethargic and you don't want to get out of bed? Things along those lines. That can head you in the direction of being able to ask a very simple question. Do you ever have any times where you wish you didn't have to get up in the morning? What sort of things would that, like that are going on for you? And also, you know, perfect example of this would be, well, so I hear you're not really interested in coming to counseling. You don't feel like anything's going to really help. It sounds like you're pretty hopeless. How often do you have those hopeless feelings? And if you do, you know, let's say they do, tell me, do you ever think about not being around anymore? And then they say, oh, yeah, okay, well... What does that look like for you? Ever thought about taking your own life or harming yourself? And what I would say is harming yourself is a little bit better way of looking at that. And then move into what that would look like. And you have to denote the difference between self-injury and suicidal ideation. Okay, Self-injury is when people injure but without the intent 
of killing themselves. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not dangerous. It doesn't mean that it could particularly kill them because some people do this not thinking or not working towards trying to harm themselves seriously, like trying to make an attempt on their life, but they still can get there depending on what sort of things they're doing. This includes cutting, hair pulling, also, you know, bruising, other things along those lines, pounding, and doing things that aren't going to be good for them. And that even includes substances as well. Doing things that are very erratic, very risky behaviors, that also denotes some idea of, you know, not necessarily caring too much about what might happen to them. Then we're going to get into other things such as thought process and content. Um, this stuff you'll see a lot in regards to any sort of hallucinations, delusions, things along those lines. But also, you can tell you some stuff that might be going on organically. Um, brain injuries, things along those lines. Um, things like word salad, um, stream of thought issues. Maybe there's some things about magical thinking, some content of thought issues. Um, continuity thought, con continuity of thought, I'm sorry. Um, you know, perseverating on the same exact thought pattern. You know, they keep coming back around to the same thought. They keep coming around. It's like a little cycle with that. Those sort of things you want to take a good look at because they can denote certain issues in regards to cognitive functioning and possibly in many cases mood. Um, a few other things I want to make note of. Uh, obsessions. That's a big one in thought process and content. You're going to see a lot of this with anxiety, but you also may see it with psychosis and even depression. Um, if there's resulting compulsions along with that, you can note that in the in the behavior section or the thought process section, but it's particularly important for you to take a look at. Um, a few other things I want to make note of. We have perception, attention, orientation, and memory. Now, a lot of these you can go through pretty quickly depending on where they're at. Um, perception goes within the five senses. So the five senses are looking at, you're looking at hallucinations, illusions, depersonalization, derealization. Now, obviously we know all our five senses. And those are taste, so um, taste, smell, sight, hearing, touch, stuff along those lines, right? Those are the, those are the things that you're going to be working on trying to denote here. Now, these might include hallucinations, illusions, depersonalization, derealization, and that might mean that, and I really take a look deeper look within the book of what it says about depersonalization, derealization, because those two are not interchangeable necessarily. There's a two little different things, um, uh, and I think it's important to make a notation there. Uh, a couple things, hallucinations are pretty simple. Um, are they things that they really think are happening? Is, this, is there an organic component to that? And that's when we're going to get into that medical history follow-up as well. Um, the next piece is going to be intention. And this tension goes particularly along with distractibility. Um, unfortunately, ADHD is one of the more highly diagnosed disorders, especially in young people. Now, when we talk about ADHD, um, overall, one of these disorders that's often diagnosed, and, I, and like I said, it's highly diagnosed and sometimes overdiagnosed in many cases, how distractible they are, what sort of focus and attention issues may they have. Are these things that are affecting them in several different areas of life, obviously? And we're talking about that going back to that functioning piece. The next piece is orientation. And orientation looks something along the lines of what is going on with them in regards to person, place, and time. And this really denotes cognitive dysfunction. Sometimes that might include things along the lines of, you know, uh, I would say something like uh, Alzheimer's, other things along those lines. Why can they remember things? Do they know where they're at? Do they know what's going on? Are they with it right now? A few of the questions I ask, um, I ask, who are they? Do they know who they are? If they're saying something along the lines of God, that might be a little bit of an issue, right? Um, we might want to get, come dial back there and kind of get a little bit more information there. Other things like, do they know where they're at? Do they, you know, sometimes people don't know the exact building they're at, and that's not something to be concerned about. Um, but they know that they're in a counseling session. They know that they've just met you. They know that, you know, around about what time it is. These are the sort of things you might ask. Um, but also, something I usually ask just to get some good information and to also integrate this into our next section, which is memory, is I ask them about current events. I ask them, who's the current president, for example. You know, sometimes you might get an emotional reaction to that as well. But at the same time, it gives them some idea, it gives you some idea of where they're at currently and what's going on for them. All right, so memory, we're going to include remote, recent, and immediate. Um, I utilize all sorts of historical and current events. Um, 
Like I said, the president's a good one to utilize that hits for both orientation and for memory. Another historical event is, you know, you know, maybe utilize something that's going on that month or that they would have witnessed in their lifetime, obviously, between what they were to remember. So you don't ask a five-year-old what was going on on 9-11 or what they know about that. You might ask that to someone who's in their, you know, maybe their late, tw you know, their 20s or 30s or 40s. Um, somebody who's older, you might ask them about something even further back. And those sort of things can help you get a good idea of where they're at currently. Also, utilizing the idea of three single words. You know, give them cat, bag, hair. And say, okay, can you repeat those back to me? If they can't repeat them back right away, we have some, basically some very immediate concerns in regards to memory. If you ask them in five minutes and they can't remember them back, then those are more concerns about recent. Now, usually people can get two out of three. If you get zero or one, we might have some issues that we have to more get a deeper understanding of um, and possibly some organic issues in regards to the brain. Next we have judgment. Judgment is basically the ability to exercise positive judgment in social situations. And that's I'm using that quote from the book because it's probably the best way to describe it. If you can basically say, okay, I know how to interact socially. Now we're going to see some stuff like, for example, when we look at the personality disorder, some people have no concept around this. And some people don't have a good idea, especially if they're removed from reality a little bit. Um, so we look at stuff like psychosis and other things along those lines. Those might have some issues where they're not exercising positive judgment. Um, and also that include in substance issues. Um, people are not giving the, don't have the, the thought of mind to say, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't drink as much as I did because this has happened last time, that happened the time before. People with several DUIs don't have very good judgment in that area. They think, oh, well, it won't happen to me again. It won't happen to me again. And that tells you a little bit about their judgment. The next one is intelligence, info, and abstraction. Now, I, these, these are things you're mostly going to do if you're doing a full battery of tests, and that's something we'll get into later, such as an IQ test. But you can do general, get a general emphasis on what their intelligence is like. Um, now, intelligence is not always aligned with education. You want to make note of that. Um, the next er area would be insight. And that really means, do they have an awareness of why they're there? What's going on in their life? Do they understand that there might be some issues? And this is something really to take a look at, especially, and we're going to do this in class the next time, is we're going to look specifically at why the client I was playing may or may not have insight. That might be something really important to note. Do they know why they're there? Do they didn't know why there might be an issue with what, they're, what kind of behavior they were exhibiting? That's something I kind of left in the gray area, and I think it can differ for different clients. Some people really want to be there. They understand why they're there. They understand the issues. They just don't know how to fix them. That's why they're coming to counseling. Others are sitting there, I don't understand any of my issues, but I know something's wrong. And then still others, I don't have any issues, which is a whole other ballgame we'll get into later. All right, so other stuff you want to get into, auxiliary data, and that includes stuff with family and friends. If you're working with kids, that's incredibly important to get that information. If you don't have it, it's going to be really hard to get so much out of the kid unless they're a little older. Um, other things would be a complete medical history and physical examination. If you can get them to go to a doctor and get an idea of what's going on there, often medical things go right along with mental health things. Um, lab tests if they're available. Um, any sort of other interviews that you can standardize, that's great. Any psych tests that may have been done by another provider or if you're going to do them yourself. I work alongside providers all the time. It's really helpful. And also any sort of brain imaging studies. So if you have, they have had some, say, some traumatic brain injury, and there's some sort of study that goes along with that. Maybe it's an MRI. Maybe it's a CAT scan. Maybe it's something along those lines. That's really important. Then you're going to get into the summary of findings. Do your five-axis diagnosis, which we're going to get into later, and you'll do a lot more later on. And then you're going to obviously get into what's going to happen next. What are our treatment goals? What's our treatment plan? And under treatment plan, think about different things. First off, immediate management. What are we immediately doing right now to manage the condition that they're coming in with? What does that look like? And that's going to be important for them when they leave that first session. What are we going to start looking at immediately? It's not, okay, I got all my information, goodbye. You try to sum things up in order for them to understand there's a reason for them to come back. What are we doing here? And then as you develop this over time, start thinking about some, during that, after that first session, some short-term interventions and strategies, and then some longer-term sort of therapeutic modalities. And that's something we're going to get to a little bit further in the class. Thanks a lot, and I look forward to seeing all of you in class this week.